After Jesus had said this, he went on, to, on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached, approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Where are, why are you untying it, tell them the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along and people spread their cloaks on the road, uh, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the, most, in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, if you even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the timing of God's coming to you. Romans chapter 8 and I'll read verses 18 through 39. Romans 8, 18 through 39, and the focus for our message this morning will be verses 29 and 30. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit, is intercedes, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
you have no doubt heard the phrase rose-colored glasses. One who is described in such a way is an optimistic person who sees life as through glasses that make everything seem rosy and good. Well, instead of rose-colored glasses, Paul wants us to put on salvation-colored glasses. If rose-colored glasses make everything seem good, then salvation-colored glasses trust that God is working in everything for good. Paul said in verse 28 that all things work together for good. The promise for believers is that God is using every circumstance, every trial, and every struggle to bring about ultimate good. And Paul wants them and us to view life in such a manner, to see the good and kind hand of God in and behind everything. Well, how can we be assured that this is indeed the case? How can we be sure that this promise is true? How do we know that all things really work together for our good? See, the promise of verse 28 is one that we all want to believe is true. That all things are working together for good. We want to know that our suffering and hardships are not pointless. We want to believe that good will come out of even the most horrible circumstances and tragic events. While we may not be able to see the sunshine through the gloom, we want God's assurance that it is indeed there. So what Paul does in verses 29 and 30 is give reasons why we can be confident of the truthfulness of this promise and the faithfulness of God. And we'll look at two reasons drawn from verses 29 and 30. We can have assurance that God is working out all things for good in our lives because of God's good plan of salvation and because of God's good purpose of salvation. Our first point is God's good plan of salvation, and we'll spend most of our time on this point. In these two verses, 29 and 30, Paul gives us a great chain of God's work for us from eternity past to eternity future. And his point here is clear. If God has done this great and timeless work in our lives, and if he has an infinitely glorious plan for us, then we can be assured that whatever he brings into our lives in the present is for ultimate good. The five verbs that make up the chain of salvation that we see in 29 and 30 are foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. And these are all works of God. This is what God has done, is doing, and will do in the lives of his people. Salvation is God's work in us and for us from eternity past, guaranteeing both our eternal future and his goodness towards us in the present. And so let us look at each of the five words. And while the theology behind them is heavy, it is important to meditate on these things so that we might be in awe of the eternal love of God for us. And so that we might bask in this love and be confident in his mercy. And so we begin with foreknew. He foreknew. God's foreknowledge. Paul is taking us back in time. Actually, he's taking us back before time existed. When there was nothing but God. No people, no earth, no angels, just God. God knew what he was going to do. He knew how history was going to unfold. He knew the universe that would be created, the angelic beings, and every person who would ever live. He was aware of each person, whether they would never see the light of day, dying in their mother's womb, or whether their lifetime would span many decades. God in eternity past knew all people and all that would happen in time and space. But the idea of God's foreknowledge, as Paul uses it here, goes beyond that. The term has a deeper meaning than what God knew. See, frequently we see in the scriptures knowledge referring to more than simply knowing about something or someone. When we read that Adam and Eve knew each other, 
the biblical writer means more than that than that they knew details about each other because as a result of this knowledge Eve conceived and bore a son in Amos 3 2 the NIV translates the word no as chosen when God says to the nation of Israel you only have I chosen a literal translation is you only have I known well God knew about all of the nations in the world He created them. He made them. He raised them up. And yet he says to Israel, you only have I known. Of all of the nations, you are the one that I have a relationship with. You are my special people. I am your God. This is a special, intimate knowledge that God is talking about. And then Jesus says about those who do not follow him, he says, depart from me. For I never knew you. Well, of course Jesus knew about them. He's conversing with them. But he's saying that I don't have this relationship with you. You're not men and women of faith. You don't trust in me. There's not this saving relationship. Well, likewise, when we come to the term foreknowledge in Romans 8.29, it means more than God simply knowing about the people who will exist in time and space. It is an active knowledge of God, whereby God not only knows but determines to bring things to pass in the future. And in terms of people, when it said that God foreknows someone, it means that he predetermines to have a loving and intimate relationship with certain individuals. So from eternity past, God foreknew, God determined, to love his people. And so if you are a child of God, it is because in eternity past, before the earth even existed, God foreknew you. God chose to love you. So great is his affection for you. The love God has for his children is an enduring, powerful love. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Because God had decided to enter into a never-ending relationship of love with some people, he predestined them to salvation in his Son. God chose those whom he would save. Now some people do not like the word predestined. Or the idea that our salvation is ultimately God's choice. But the reality is, That is the teaching of Scripture, and that is the way that it has to be. As I've said before, remember that Romans 8 comes after Romans 1 through 3. And Paul could not be clearer in those chapters that all people, without exception, are sinners who need salvation. We, by nature, do not and will not choose to follow God. Our nature will always lead us away from God. People who do not like the idea of predestination, that God chooses people to be saved, give far too much credit to humanity. For they think that we have the ability to choose God. An illustration that I find helpful is this. And we talked about this a few weeks ago in the Bible study. If you were to put out two piles of food before a lion, a pile of raw meat and a pile of lettuce, Where will the lion go? He's going to go to the meat. If you had a hundred lions lined up, where would a hundred lions go? They'd all go to the raw meat. That is their nature. If you had a hundred sinners, not one of them would on their own account choose God because it's not in our sinful nature to do so. If you had a hundred sinners, a thousand sinners, a million sinners, a billion sinners, not one would choose God. That's what Paul says, Romans 3.11. There is no one who seeks God. That's what it means to be dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1. We do not seek out God by ourselves. If salvation was dependent on us choosing God, then no one would be saved. No one would turn to God. No one would repent and believe. That's what the scriptures teach. 
And so God must act, and he did act in eternity past, choosing to save some. What predestination means is that God chose to save some of those who had rebelled against him and who had forsaken him. Forsaken him. God predetermined in eternity past to save a people to himself, not based on our own works, but because of his free and unmerited grace. God did not choose. God did not have to choose any. He would have been just in saving none. But God mercifully decided to save some. God predestined his people for salvation. And those whom he predestined, as we go down to verse 30, he also called. Now with the third word, the word called, Paul now moves into time and space. The first two occurred before the creation of the universe. God setting his affection on a certain group of people. But now he is talking about what God has done in our lives after we were born. And the idea of being called by God is being called unto salvation. If we are saved, it is because God has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And this idea of calling is used in various ways and in various places in the scriptures. There is a general gospel call. When we share the truth about Jesus, we call on people to respond. We lay before them their need to believe in Jesus Christ and call on them to do so. As Paul says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We call on you to turn to him and trust in him. And when we give the gospel call, some heed the call. They repent and believe. But some reject the call and continue in their sin and disobedience. But if we look at the work of God behind the scenes, What enables someone to accept the gospel call and to believe? And the reason why one believes is because of the work of God in their lives. Because God has called them to salvation. Jesus says in John 6.44, No one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. And that's the idea of calling. God drawing sinners. God calling sinners. God taking away our spiritual blindness so that we can see who we really are. So that we see our sinfulness. So that we see our great eternal need. And that Jesus Christ is the one who meets that need. Faith is a gift of God. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So God calls his people unto salvation. Now as an aside, this doesn't mean that we are to be inactive. Some people have used this theology as a justification for saying, if God wants to save people, God's going to do it and I don't need to do anything about it. But there's the human responsibility balance that we see in Scripture. The Great Commission We have been commanded to go out, to make disciples, to share the gospel message with people from all nations. And we don't know whose heart God is working in. And so we share the message with all. We spread the seed, as it were, and let God worry about his own work. And if you have not yet believed in the gospel, You're not to get lost in a theological and philosophical speculation about whether you are called of God or not. What you are to do is repent and believe. Let God take care of his work and do what you were commanded to do, which is to look to the Savior and live. Moreover, those he called, he also justified. The next link on the glorious chain of God's work in bringing about our salvation is justification. Now remember what what Paul is doing here. He's saying, look at what God has done for you. Look at how much God has loved you. You are to view your sufferings, your trials in this life, in the grand picture of God's sovereign, compassionate work in you and for you. If God has loved you this much, 
that he sent his eternal that he sent his eternal favor upon you then you know that everything that comes into your life is for your good and so the fourth word is justification this is the great declaration that Paul opens the chapter with in verse in uh, verse 1 of chapter 8 there is now no condemnation those who are justified have moved from the state of being guilty before God and of being counted as his enemies to becoming friends with God, saved and adopted into his family. And again, this is a work that is done by God. All of these words that we are looking at, foreknew, predestined, called, justified and glorified, they're all works of God. They're things that are done without our work or our input. We cannot justify ourselves and work our way into God's good favor. God demands perfection, and we are far from perfect. We cannot do that which is necessary to be acceptable in God's eyes. We cannot stand before God dressed in our own righteousness, for our own righteousness is his filthy rags. But there is hope in the justification that comes from God. Ephesians 2 As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So once again, Paul says, that's our natural state. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. But because of his great love for us, God worked. God acted. These are wonderful words. We are sinners deserving of hell. But because of his grace, God justifies. He can declare us righteous because he has provided the Savior. And that's what we're remembering this time of year. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, riding into Jerusalem. He comes to bring peace through his death. His death on a cross. Jesus rides into the city knowing that the cross awaits. But he rides on in love so that he might save his people from their sins. Jesus knows that if he does not go to the cross, then there will be no justification. There will be no salvation. We will all be forever lost in our sins. Jesus goes to the cross so that all those who believe in him might be justified and receive eternal life. These are humbling words, aren't they? The fact that salvation is of God. Salvation is of the Lord as Jonah prays. We can't earn it. We can't do it. That's ultimately what faith is. Is the recognition that I can't save myself and that I need God. I need Jesus Christ for eternal life, for forgiveness of my sins. And the beauty of what Paul is saying is that God does it that he provides the sufficient, acceptable salvation. The final word is he glorified. Paul has told them that their salvation was conceived in the mind of God in eternity past. Not only just the plan of salvation, but God predetermined those whom he would save, those who would be his people. And if you are his, that means that God set his saving affections upon you. And his plan has no end. The verb glorified is in the same tense as the previous verbs, not because it is already accomplished in our lives, and we're not glorified yet, but to emphasize the certainty of that which is to come. The work needed to bring about our glorification, which will happen in the future, has already been accomplished. Those who are justified will be glorified. Of that there is no doubt. And so we look forward to the glory that is to come. 
Paul has such a high view of the new heavens and the new earth that he says the painful sufferings of the moment. And when we read through the New Testament, we know that Paul had extensive sufferings. He says that they are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to that which is to come. In the perfection of heaven, we too will be glorified. We will be made perfect, free from sin, without fault or blemish. We will be able to stand in the presence of God and have an eternal, unhindered relationship with Him. In these verses, Paul wants to give his readers the big picture. Think of God's great plan of salvation from eternity past to eternity future. Think about the fact that God has bestowed His eternal, infinite, saving love upon you. A love that chose you even though you were unlovely. A love that justified you even though the cost was His only begotten Son's blood. A love that makes eternal, glorious promises to you. In the context of God's great saving love, you can know for certain that this God who loves you so much will certainly use all events and circumstances in your life for good. Yes, there will be suffering in the present time. But in these things, we can rest in the love of God, that he has a good purpose in them. Maybe he's maturing our faith. Maybe he's exposing our sins. Maybe he's strengthening our character. Maybe he's drawing our hearts away from the enticements of the world. Or maybe he's working in us a longing for heaven. But whatever his plan is, we know that it is good. It is for our good. Paul tells them and us that when we go through fiery trials, we are never to forget that God is for us. And this is clearly seen in his great eternal plan of salvation. The second reason Paul gives in these verses is God's good purpose of salvation. So how do we know that Romans 8.28 is true? How do we know that everything really does work for good for those who love God? Well, because of God's great plan of salvation and God's great purpose of salvation. Why did God save you if you were a believer? Why did God do all of this work that we have just been talking about to save you and to give you the glorious gift of eternal life. Why did God take a slave trader like John Newton and bestow his amazing grace upon him? Why did God take an affluent and worldly young man like George Mueller and divinely provide forgiveness and eternal life for him? Why did God take a zealous persecutor, Saul, and reveal the glorious truth of salvation and life to Why did God save you? We'll look at verse 29 for the answer. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God saved you with the purpose of making you like Christ. All of the saving work that God has done in your life from eternity past has been done with the purpose of conforming you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think back to the account of creation. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They were initially able to have this perfect fellowship and communion communion and communication with God. But when they sinned, the image of God became marred and tainted. They now knew separation from God. They were plagued with the presence and consequences of sin. All is not right and all is not as it should be. But God's great purpose in salvation is to bring about reconciliation and restoration. We are going to be forever like the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. For all eternity, God will be shown to be loving and glorious because we will bear the image of His Son. The image of God upon us will be restored. Now, we don't fully know and understand how we as creatures can be conformed to the image of the second person of the Trinity to Jesus Christ, the the Son of God, the God-man. But the word 
of God is that that is his plan. That we might be like Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world did not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is the end that God has in mind for us, to be Christ-like. And this process will be completed when we are in glory. But the process has already started. And so when we think of our lives in the here and now, and especially in terms of our suffering, we need to view it in light of the work that God is doing in us. God is determined to make us more like Christ. And sometimes what is required for us to be more like Christ is for us to go through suffering, for us to go through hardship and pain. And here are just a few ways that suffering is used to make us more like Christ. Suffering causes us to grow in Christ-like faith. Jesus has perfect faith. And suffering shows us our weakness. It shows us our need of God. It shows us our insufficiency. And so with Peter, we understand his call out to Jesus as he's sinking. He thought he could walk on water and then when he looked around when he was distracted he started to sink and then he said Lord save me. Lord I'm sinking. And what did he do? He reached out to God. He reached out to Jesus Christ. And that's what suffering can do for us. It can cause us to instinctively reach up to God to reach out to Christ and say save me, help me. I can't do it. I need you. Only you. Suffering causes us to grow in Christ-like faith. Suffering also causes us to grow in Christ-like priorities. There's a song that was released a while ago, Live Like You Were Dying. And the thought behind the song is, if you know that your end is in sight and is drawing quickly, well, then it's going to change your priorities. You're going to live in a different way. And so the moral of the song is live that way all the time. Well, suffering has a way of showing us our mortality. Suffering has a way of showing us what is truly important. And that is the priorities of God. Christ prayed, Thy will be done. Christ's concern was for the glory of God, that the kingdom be built up. Christ wasn't enamored with the things of this world. And when we go through suffering, it has a way of showing us the futility, the insignificance of the things that people in this world pay so much attention to. You know, I was thinking, obviously, we've had a number of funerals. And, you know, as somebody who likes sports, there's a lot of excitement about sports and various times of year and sporting events and, you know, finals and playoffs and these things. And it just struck me one time when I was going to the hospital and do a visit. And it's like, you know, the person I'm visiting, they don't really care. You know, they're going to go and see Jesus. And the sporting world is ultimately irrelevant. It doesn't matter to them who's going to win the Stanley Cup, who's going to win the World Series. They're going to see Jesus face to face. And suffering has a way of doing that, teaching us what is truly important, causing us to grow in Christ-like priorities. Suffering also causes us to grow in Christ-like character. Romans 5, 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Suffering produces character. Suffering and hardships bring our character flaws and weaknesses to light. When the going gets tough, we find out what we're really made of. 
And some of the things that come to light, that come to the surface, aren't very good. We see our flaws. We see our weaknesses. And suffering provides us with an opportunity to grow and mature. To plead with the Spirit to come and to sanctify us. And fourthly, suffering causes us to grow in Christ-like hope. So if you're filling the words on in the back of the bulletin, they would be, suffering causes us to grow in Christ like faith, priorities, character, and hope. Christ Christ endured the cross because he was looking forward to that which is to come. For the joy that was set before him. And suffering can do that for us as well. It causes us to fix our eyes not on the here and now, but on that which is to come on the glory that will come. It draws our minds and our hearts to heaven and to the presence of God. This world is a veil of tears. Our existence in this life is characterized by suffering and pain. But there is a far greater story. God is working all things for the ultimate good of his people. Of this we can be assured. We can be assured of this when we look at God's good plan of salvation. If God has loved us so much and saved us with so great a salvation, then surely He will use all things for our good and His glory. And we can be assured of this when we look at God's good purpose of salvation. God is at work in us so that we might be conformed to Jesus Christ. And all that comes into our lives, including suffering, is for that end. Again, God's desire for us in the here and now is not to give us a nice, cushy, perfect life of ease. God's desire for us in the here and now is to conform us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And suffering is one of the means by which he does that. And so what these verses are, ultimately, is a call to faith. To trust in the very nature of God. That he is good and loving and wise and powerful. Do you believe in him? Have you trusted in him for eternal life? The gospel call goes out to you this morning. Will you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ? And then do you live a life of faith? Do you have salvation-tinted eyes that view events of this world and the events of your life in the context of God's eternal purposes and plans? Do you look at your life with salvation-colored glasses, always mindful of the amazing grace of God that has been at work in you before the foundation of the world and is at work in you now and will be at work in you forever if you are his child? We'll bless one another with these words. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you We thank you for your great plan of salvation. And our Father, we've covered a lot of ground and there are many thoughts. Our Father, I pray that each and every individual in this room would get the main point, which is that your love is so deep, so infinite, so great, and that we can rest in that love no matter what circumstances come our way, knowing that that you are a God who knows what you are doing and that you have a perfect eternal plan for us. Our Father, we thank you that you are trustworthy. Strengthen our faith, we pray in Jesus' name.